Welcome everybody. I'm Alison Hordale. I'm from uh, I'm one of the co-chairs of UBR Lab Manchester, along with Louis Strapazon and Dave Beck, who are also on the call. It's wonderful to see you all here this evening. Um, it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? You set up a meeting ages in advance and all of a sudden it's here. It's exciting because it's actually happening. That's brilliant. And um, I'll just say one thing about basic income, because I know some people aren't from the world of UBI. Um, what we're hoping to do is to not go into the details of what universal basic is, income is too much. So if you wish to know more about that, um, hopefully Louis is putting up, uh, going to put some links in the chat for us to UBR Lab Manchester and to the UBR Lab Network and hopefully also the five principles of UBI. So if you want to know more about uh, UBI, there's we there's plenty of uh, information and videos, et cetera, we can provide you with, but we're not gonna go into all that just this evening. Now we've been looking at UBI Lab Manchester, we've been looking at homelessness and UBI for a couple of years now, uh, talking to people and building awareness and, and contacts. Uh, and also working on preparation this meeting are our colleagues from the UBI Lab Network. And we've got Daniel Melmelstein from UBI Lab London. He volunteers at his ho local homeless shelter in Finchley, which is in the north of London. And Johnny Douglas from the UBI Lab Network, which is part of the greater network that the UBI Lab Manchester belongs to. Just to give you a bit of background, we had a round table discussion on the 3rd of July, which was hosted by UBL of Manchester and the Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity. And this is um, this was a very interesting discussion with people in the homelessness sector around Greater Manchester. We had a talk from Simon Duffy from the Citizen Network on, um, on, the, on the whole area of what UBI could do for, the, for people who are homeless. And um, Louis is going to put the link to that in. And if you really want to look at the background to UBI and homelessness, um, there's a lot of links in there. There's a lot of, there's Simon Duffy's slideshow and there's his reflections on the meeting. So that's going to be, uh, that would be a really useful resource. If you're gonna click on one thing tonight, I recommend you do that. Now, the next date with last year was the Basic Income North Conference on the 20th of July. And we were hoping to have um, a session on um, UBI and homelessness there. Unfortunately, it had to stop being uh, in person. It had to be online because of train strikes. So it had to be cut considerably. And so we didn't manage to have a discussion on UBI and homelessness. But in the end, I'm quite pleased about that because a lot's happened since then. We have met uh, Mark Donovan, who is from the Denver Basic Income Project, who's going to talk to us tonight. And we've all, we also met Jonathan Town and his colleague, Ollie Walsh, who are from Greater Change. So if had we gone ahead with the, uh, the session last July, we wouldn't have had these wonderful speakers. So that's absolutely great. Anyway, um, I'm going to stop talking now. Uh, if you've got questions, please, could you put them in the chat with a queue in front of them? And it'd be great if we could keep them fairly, fairly short and, and to be questions rather than um, sort of long discussions of things. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Fran Darlington Pollock, who is the CEO of the Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity. And she's going to give us some background on homelessness across Greater Manchester which is the area in the north of England that man in which Manchester sits. Thank you very much, Fran. Hello, everyone, and thank you for that. I'm just sharing my screen. It's the classic tech moments. Um, firstly, Alison, thank you for having me and to everyone else here, uh, both in the UK and internationally. It's lovely to be talking to you on what is here fairly dreary evening in Greater Manchester, which is not unusual for this time of year. Um, oh, it's on a timer. That's exciting, isn't it? How's it done that? Um, so what I wanted to say and um, start with is tell you a bit about why we're here. So as Alison touched on, this for us is part of an um, important, although admittedly slow moving piece of work around the, the possibility of U UBI as a solution to homelessness. 
And this whole kind of conversation um, to me was quite exciting, particularly when I first had the conversation with Alison, because it was an idea that already resonated with some of my background and experiences I've had before. So like sandwiched between a longer career as an academic and this current role at Greater Manchester Merge Charity, I worked in Save the Children. And I'm touching on that because the idea of unconditional cash transfers has much more traction in the development and humanitarian context than it perhaps does in conversations within um, domestic policy, for example, particularly homelessness. And there's lots of different reasons for that. Um, but some of them, I think, are really, really critical for when we're thinking about homelessness. And this sets the scene for saying the extent of homelessness in Greater Manchester. I should also say that one of the things that actually attracted me to the role at Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity was an affiliation with a project that might get touched on elsewhere in the evening, so I won't go into it, but led by the Centre for Homelessness Impact, which is a pilot of the idea of conditional, unconditional, importantly, unconditional cash transfers um, to support people who are experiencing street homelessness and specifically personal grants. So to kind of get them on their feet. So there's precedent. That's important. Anyway, the reason why I'm saying all this is because those unconditional trans cash transfers have most traction because the evidence shows that they're cost effective, agency enabling, and really importantly, given some of the power dynamics in those development and humanitarian contexts, power balancing. So it's thinking about the kind of the white savior complexes that people might be familiar with, all those tensions between countries typically in the West and global majority or global South. And that's just really important when we're talking about homelessness. And the reason for that is because of what we say drives homelessness. What are the causes? Homelessness ultimately is an acute manifestation of poverty. And more broadly, it's the consequence of really, really problematic social security systems and impossible housing markets. Doesn't matter where you're set, that is definitely true. And although I'm not gonna talk about those drivers in much depth, the reason again why I'm saying this is because it's really important we look upstream at the structural and political determinants of homelessness rather than at an individual level through a lens that is kind of really heavily distorted by discriminatory stereotypes of homelessness or the homeless. And the problem with that is as soon as we say the homeless, what we're doing is we're homogenizing a, a group of people um, and it's erasing their identities, their experiences, um, the diversity really of people who experience or are at risk of homelessness and rough sleeping. From that point, it's really easy to use sweeping policy generalizations to counter any sort of adoption of um, unconditional cash transfers for those homogenous groups, the homeless. Because if you're equating street homelessness, for example, with failed life choices, addictions, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, criminal behavior, you're essentially saying, actually, it's then quite easy to argue that an unconditional cash transfer is simply gonna be used to further those problems and behaviors and not to end the experience of street homelessness which is ignoring what's actually driving it. So economic factors, housing market, and those policies that may or may not be giving people the sort of safety net they need. So with that in mind, I do have a point, don't worry. Um, what's the experience of Greater Manchester um, and how does it kind of compare nationally? And importantly, what are we doing uh, innovatively? So just to kind of reflect all of that in one single statement, the thing that motivates us at Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity, I'm not going to give you a big history of us, is a statement like this. So the moment that someone becomes homeless is not an isolated incident that happens out of the blue. It's a milestone on a journey that could be prevented and halted at a number of junctures on the way. Um, this is important, again, because we're thinking about those cost effectiveness and we're thinking about what you're doing when you're intervening in homelessness and particularly what do we do in Greater Manchester. So now some statistics and some terrible graphs, I have to say, I'd definitely be telling my students off as a former academic, but let's look at this. This is the rough sleeping snapshot. There's a lot of issues with the way of counting rough sleeping and doing it as a single snapshot. We're not gonna go into them, but just look at the data and more specifically look at the pattern. You can see from 2010 up to 2017, there was a really steep in increase there. And there's obviously a story to that. Something happened in 2010, things changed, and we see a rise in rough sleeping. It then starts to fall off in 2017. Nationally, there was a different agenda, an effort to try and address rough sleeping. And then something really, really big happened around 2020, and we had a very big change in terms of the rate of reduction in rough sleeping um, because the pandemic and the everyone in policies gave us a way out. But since then, 
again, we've had some other things going on in the economy, for example, and we start to see a rise again. That picture is um, as similar in Greater Manchester in some ways as it is nationally, but there is a difference and that difference is really important. And it's the rate of change from that peak in rough sleeping that we saw in 2017 in Greater Manchester, which is this blue line compared to the rate of change you see in England. And the reason be put behind that is the innovation in Greater Manchester. So in 2017, 2018, we had a, a new Metro Mayor elected, the first Metro Mayor for the city region elected, and his priority was to end rough sleeping because of that humanitarian crisis we were seeing. In particular in Greater Manchester, um, we were also um, enjoying the Beast from the East, as it was called, which was a particular sustained spell um, of cold snap. So that drove a series of collaborations across the city region and how we all work together um, sorry, I was just checking my time. How are we all working together and what we're doing to tackle rough sleeping and end the humanitarian crisis? It was also the birth of the Greater Manchester Mayor's Charity. And what we all did together through a collective organisations, not working in silos, actually working cross sector together, was implement the Bed Every Night scheme alongside other multifaceted, multifaceted responses to rough sleeping. And the Bed Every Night scheme is unrivaled in the UK because it is a universal offer. It's based on the premise that no one should have to spend a night on the streets. And it's not constrained by the kind of statutory requirements of um, government funding or tax funding, for example, because of the income that we bring into it. So as a funder, we raise money through corporate partnerships and the business community in the city region and mean that when that money goes back out to local authorities to commission services for rough sleeping, there is space to not only give beds to people who otherwise wouldn't be a priority in the kind of um, local authority priorities, um, thinking about the sorts of people who might present as homeless or rough sleeping, um, but it also means that it's accessible to people who have no recourse to public funds. That is innovative. It is problematic. There are warts and all in this system, but look at that change. That is significant. However, homelessness, as we should all know, is not just rough sleeping. It is far more multifaceted than that. So to go in a bit deeper and show us some of the other picture of Greater Manchester, this is data from 2018 to 2019, which is when we were set up, which is why I've chosen then. And it's looking at numbers of households that have presented at their local authority as at risk of homelessness. And then the local authority has been like, yep, you are Either you're imminently at risk of homelessness in the, the next 56 days or, my word, you are already homeless. We need to help you now and get you some accommodation at least for the next six months. In England, in London, in the Northwest, this has been going up since though since 2018 2019 we're seeing a continual rise actually we did see a little a little drop in 2020 21 for the northwest but greater manchester does struggle despite the innovation going on there you can't kind of innovate out of some of the structural factors that we have no um ability to tackle so that's one way of looking at homelessness, and I'm going to dive in a bit deeper, hopefully as a nice segue or jumping point for uh, Jonathan and Mark to talk more uh, specifically about UCTs. Um, Centrepoint, who are the national charity in the UK for youth homelessness, and youth homelessness specifically is young people aged 18 to 24, um, they have, and we're a signature to this, there's a collective campaign to I respond to the fact that last year, and this is an increase on the year before, nationally 135,800 young people approached their local authority as homeless. Um, that's a lot of people. And outside of London, which has the highest number, the North West has the second highest, which is 17,600. This is not their fault. Think again of kind of looking upstream, structural factors, um, housing costs, etc. But then again, thinking about money and cost effective policies, Centrepoint estimate that those young people alone cost the economy 8.5 billion a year. Five and a half billion of that is simply the lost opportunity costs of those people not working, for example. So the kind of it's not just a moral case to tackle homelessness or implement a cost effective solution. There is a staggering um, cost effective or economic argument to it, too. They suggest that equates to the cost of a, a salary for a police officer for every young person. So that's twenty seven thousand three hundred forty seven pounds a year. Just finally, then, to reiterate, 
what it is we do in Manchester. We do love that phrase. We do things differently in Greater Manchester. And we really are. We do have that innovation around a bed every night, despite its challenges. We are seeing um, general reduction. We have not got back to the peak of rough sleeping that we saw in 2017. Chances are we're going to see some unpleasant statistics next week when the rough sleeping data comes out again. But this is not due to local counter efforts. It's due to those national issues that are driving it. We have a serious amount of collaboration integration through things like the Greater Manchester Homeless Homelessness Action Network, from which we saw the birth of the Bed Every Night scheme. And we also have um, a very closely co-produced prevention strategy at the GM level, which is award winning for its co-production and thinking about the different issues and how you can tackle homelessness together, how you can do that innovatively and cost effectively. So that's me. I'm really happy to take more questions and how that relates to things like UCT um, afterwards. But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fran. That that was that was brilliant. That was really interesting. I'm not going to say too much now, but I'm going to move us from rainy Manchester in the evening to Denver, Colorado. At eleven o'clock in the morning, and we now have Mark Donovan to talk to, help talk to us about the Denver Basic Income Project. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, and thank you all for having me here today. Let me see if okay. I think we are just checking all my settings. I think we're good. My name is Mark Donovan. I'm the founder and executive director of the Denver Basic Income Project. And I'm going to start us off with just a um, a video so you can hear from some of our participants and um, a little introduction to the project, and then I'll go into more detail. So hopefully the video plays smoothly for everybody. I've been homeless before in shelters, had to stay in shelters, even with my children, which is not an easy thing to do. When we were at the roadway shelter, one of the great things they had was gardening. That's my prayer closet, kind of, a lot of times. My serenity place. The Denver Basic Income Project is a demonstration project to show the power of providing unconditional cash to people who are experiencing homelessness. And we are hearing just incredible stories of transformation. I was uh, living out of my car in, <laughs> believe this or not, in the same King Super as my son manages now, <laughs> parking lot. So in that, um, <laughs> I was in and out of the hospital for medical reasons. I was pretty much drinking myself away. But in the midst of that, now time is lapsing. You know, um, there's a gap in employment. Now you have to explain that. Lived with my parents throughout high school, and then I ended up becoming homeless because I wanted to be in a relationship, and then that's when I started using drugs. I was homeless for probably about three years, three, four years, and then I went into treatment. I moved to Joshua Station when Lucas turned one. Jennifer came to Joshua Station just about two years ago. She's a single mom and she has had some really strong desires to further her education. It took this almost two years for her to get to that starting line because there were other areas in her life that she needed to get settled first. And receiving Denver Basic Income Project helped create that stability so that then she could launch to the other areas of her life. The Colorado Coalition for the Homeless is a housing, health care, and supportive services provider. We know that when you give people resources, they do a much better job in managing their life. And so many people that we work with and work along beside of to resolve their homelessness just need a little um, access to resources. Sometimes that's in the form of housing, sometimes that's in the form of healthcare coverage, sometimes that's in the form of just basic assistance like cash. And people are really using these resources in the same way that housed individuals would use these resources. I can utilize that money for down payment, for deposit, for some month, you know. To get clothes from Lucas, toys for him, stuff for myself, do some self-care. 
When I move out of Joshua Station, I do have some money to where I can buy furniture, pay my down payment. And just even with having my youngest granddaughter with me right now and being able to, you know, have some things there for her and, you know, being able to help with her, being able to say, okay, I have a stable place now. I'm not homeless. You can come and stay with me. You know, the baby can come and stay. And we're going to provide this cash to you unconditionally. And we are showing that it is incredibly powerful and it creates an accelerated path to safety, to stability, to housing, and to thriving. We ultimately know what we need to do. We have what it takes within us to change our lives. We really do. There's a class that I'm looking into. I hope we'll get to start soon. Learning how to write grants and proposals, which is what I actually had a mini MBA in 20 years ago. This class will allow me to, you know, refresh that. Maybe like social work or human services. Um, I like helping people. I like talking with people. So something in that field. Right now I was able to start looking for work. I just can't jump on any job that would come my way or open their doors to me. I used to do that all the time just to make ends meet. Now I'm thinking uh, future, now I'm thinking my age, my health. The hope is that we can just keep the momentum going, bring as many people on board as possible, and get to that place of greater justice, of greater opportunity. <sighs> Most people don't experience that. And cash, cash is freedom and poverty is a form of incarceration, and it's wrong, and we can do better. The, um, the Denver Basic Income Project is the first and largest demonstration project in the United States to explore the impact of providing unconditional cash to people experiencing homelessness. We started organizing in 2021. Um, I'm a Denver-based entrepreneur. I spent the first 25, 28 years of my uh, career running a business. And in 2020, as COVID was hitting, I was seeing the juxtaposition of two things happening, people losing their sources of income and their stability and their housing. And at the same time, this incredible appreciation of wealth. Apple, for instance, grew by $1 trillion of market capitalization that year alone. And I felt this urgent need to try to take some action. And I was transitioning out of my business and into a new direction. And so in the summer of 2020, I started providing direct cash grants to individuals that had been impacted by COVID. And I was immediately struck by the impact it had. Started to do a deep dive on what was happening around the world. And I found the New Leaf Project in Vancouver that had run a 50 person trial with great results. I found Mayor Tubbs in Stockton, Give Directly. There was already a lot of evidence that this worked really well. And so in January of 2021, um, I took a half million dollars of my own money and seeded the project and started to organize. I brought the EU Center for Housing and Homelessness Research in. We said, we're gonna build on the Vancouver results with or without anybody else. Foundations started stepping in. Before we knew it, we had three, $4 million raised. And as an entrepreneur, I wanted to move fast. Community wanted to move slow and build trust and, and capacity. We met in the middle, we ran some tests. They were right. We took longer and built that capacity over about a year. And then we launched in the November of 2022 with 800, over 800 participants. And as of right now, we've deployed $6.8 million unconditionally to our unhoused neighbors in Denver. And we've, um, we broke it. We're running a, a rigorous randomized control trial with DU Center for Housing and Homelessness Research. We had three groups that we, um, that we are using the first group was, is receiving a thousand dollars per month for 12 months the second group received 6500 up front and 500 dollars for the second 11, for 11 months both groups getting twelve thousand dollars across the year and then we had a, an active comparison group that uh received fifty dollars a month we also gave everybody a cell phone and a, uh unlimited data and 
there was no requirement to participate in the research. And we had many people that thought that was a really bad idea, but over 92% of our participants opted in voluntarily. And what we discovered early on was when you start from a place of trust and you say, we believe in you, we trust you. First, they think you're lying. But then ultimately when you hand over the first payment or, you know, and you tell them, you establish that trust, they they realize that this is real. And so we've been getting data from over 50% of participants. So we have super, um, a super powerful and statistically significant set of data. Um, we've published interim results already on the our research page of our website, which um, will be shared in the chat. Um, we kept things very simple and wanted to be fully inclusive and accessible. So we had four criteria to be in the program. You need to be 18 or over. You need to be connected with one of our 19 partner organizations that had decades of experience working with people experiencing homelessness in Denver. You, We used the BASIS 24 screening tool to um, try to avoid working with somebody that had severe and specifically unaddressed mental health and substance needs, substance use needs. And then we you had to be um, experiencing homelessness unhoused and we used a broad definition to include people that were doubled up. Just um, we wanted to reach as many people as possible. We, we also designed the program through a racial equity lens. Um, Denver is no different than most places in the United States. So in Denver, our black community, for instance, represents less than 10% of the population, but over 25% of the unhoused population. And so we were committed to, at a very minimum, um, serving the demographics of homelessness, um, all of those systemic ish, uh, systemic uh, barriers that Fran was talking about are just um, tragic and harmful and um, and they, she's exactly right that that we need to we need to address those at the same time though that's going to take time and we view um basic income as something that we can do immediately to provide relief to provide uh, opportunity to provide hope um uh, this chart actually is my 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 pie chart disappeared on me somehow. Sorry about that. You can see the percentages though, and so that just gives you a little bit of the breakdown of the community that we're serving. Um, and one of the other interesting things in our demographics is that almost fifty percent of participants in the program have some type of disability, and um, that's always highly correlated with with um, the uh, you know people experiencing homelessness. So why are we using basic income to address homelessness? Um, we view basic income as sort of the preventative medicine of the economy. You know, when you prevent, when you prevent something and you work up front, you it costs a fraction of what it costs to treat something downstream. And so it's trying to get out ahead of this. Um, we see cash as the currency of urgency. We need a new social contract that works. We need an economy that works for all. And delay equals harm. And the beauty of unconditional basic income is that you can deploy it quickly and efficiently. And ultimately, we believe that it creates outcomes that cost less and that create many of the outcomes that everybody want in society, safer, more thriving communities, more fair communities. Um, and so we also believe that we need to uh, shift power into the hands of the people we're serving. We need to listen to them. They need to not only be at the table for, um, you know, to have their voices heard, but they need to have power to make decisions. And so cash is one way that we do that. Listening. So one of our local organizations, House Key Action Network Denver, um, surveyed over 800, over 793 of our unhoused neighbors in the top four barriers to housing, not having money, bad credit score, not having a phone, not having official documents. So we're addressing the top two and or top the number one and number three with this program. I want to get to the um I want to get towards some of the outcomes since we do have limited time and then we can follow up more with a QA. But I think what's really interesting is how much hope this creates with a community that's used to being ignored, used to being harmed and not seen and heard. 
And when we approach people in this way and give them something unconditionally and give them our trust, it creates hope. And that hope is a platform for change, for accelerated change. And so we are seeing that we're creating accelerated pathways to first and foremost for this community, safety, housing, work, wellness, stability, thriving. We're seeing that the participants in all groups are um, moving into housing faster. And that includes our comp active comparison group, which is really interesting. Uh, we're seeing uh, acceleration towards uh, work, which is one of the myths. People think that when people get basic income, they will not be incentivized to work. And that's consistently proven to be incorrect. Uh, we're seeing fewer participants sleeping outside, utilizing public health services, emergency rooms, ambulance um, trips, uh, interactions with the criminal justice system, all of that is decreasing. Um, we're seeing people have greater hope and um, um, and we're really excited. It's early days still, we're only a year into this, but uh, we're really excited. Um, oh, my chart again. All right, um, the link, which I think is probably in the chat. I'm so sorry, I'm not sure what happened here with this, with my charts. Anyway, um, on the research, uh, all of the, these, these this information is posted on our research page. And what it's showing is what I just said, is that people are um, moving towards housing faster. They're getting employed faster. Um, the results, you can uh, dive into them. And in with the Q&A, we can dive into it more. I'm not going to show charts that are empty. So it's <laughs> a disaster. Sorry. Um, What's next? We decided kind of halfway into the first year that that we know what happens when there's a benefits cliff, but we don't know what happens when you sustain an income floor. And so we decided that we wanted to run this longitudinally. And our hope is to run it as far out as we can. I'm targeting five years with this cohort, which doesn't mean we won't expand with additional funding. We can expand as well, but we think it would be really useful to see what happens. What are the outcomes compared to people not receiving basic income? If you maintain this floor below which nobody falls. We also want to show that it's replicable and that it's scalable. And we have partners that are in, willing to invest large sums 60, $100 million to take it to scale if we can prove that we can replicate it in places where people don't want to think it will can work and in um, and show that it can be scaled. So over the next couple of years, we want to keep running what the program that we have with the existing cohort, expand if we can, but show that it's replicable, show that it's scalable, and then start moving it to, to scale. So um, I think I'm going to stop there because that is... Um, Let's see, okay. Great, so yeah, so uh, just to, to conclude, um, we are, um, we're excited about where we are. The one other thing I wanted to just mention is on the funding, because two things that come up often is, first, how, how would we fund this? You know, it's, is it sustainable? And my reply is always, how do we pay for what we're doing already? It's we spend so much money on things that don't work and the problem's getting worse. So um, I I think that we have more than enough resources to to deploy. And and we believe in in respecting the agency of individuals and not thinking that we know what people need and investing in people gives them that hope, but also gives them the resources for them to take the steps that they need to get there. Uh, whether or not you need a lead funder to raise your own funds, I know that's a big struggle for everybody. It's hard to say, but uh, it certainly worked in our case by my stepping up, putting some money down, and then going to the foundations, going to the city. We have federal funds now that are in this. By getting things going, that allowed us to, now we've we've raised over $12 million to date. And um, and we think it can be done in cities all around the country and around the world. And so we want to support that. Anybody that's that wants to move forward with this, we think it can be done quickly. And we think it is going to be it can be super um, effective and powerful. And so I'm hoping to see Greater Manchester and other places adopt this and move it forward quickly. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mark. That was very inspiring. And uh, thank you for sharing the video with us. I, I, I think everybody enjoyed seeing those the, the, the stories and the participants. Um, we're now going to move on to Jonathan, Jonathan Tan. 
who is from a charity, a UK-based charity called Greater Change. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Hi, hi, everyone. So give me one second. I'm just going to share my screen here. Great. Thanks, Mark and Fran, for, for sharing uh, how your projects have been going. I, I'll, I'll speed through this because I feel like we, we want to get to the Q&A and, and, and I think we can have a bit of a discussion here. Um, but I want to tell you a little bit about our project, what we do. Um, I can tell you a little bit more about the things that we're seeing as well in terms of outcomes, which I think is probably unsurprisingly to you uh, uh, quite, quite similar thematically uh, to the stuff that we're seeing in the Denver uh, Basic Income Project. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I can, I can share a little bit more about the context in which we work in the UK as well, but obviously Fran's done a fantastic job of that, thankfully, because I haven't prepared anywhere near as, as, as high quality slides as she has uh, uh, for, 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 for this section. So, so what is Greater Change? So um, Greater Change is an organization that was started by my co-founder Alex and myself uh, back in 2017. And the idea was really simple. We were um, volunteering at a local charity in Oxford at the time called uh, Aspire. And you know, it's a wonderful charity, you know, as you do when you first get into the sector, you ask some pretty naive questions about homelessness in the UK, don't you? So you say things like, oh, well, you know, UK is the sixth wealthiest country in the world. Why does homelessness exist to the extent that it does? And as Fran touched on earlier, why are people stuck in temporary accommodation for years and years and years when it's really, it's meant to be, as the name suggests, six to 12 months stepping stone, right? But actually when we were talking to the support workers at the time, you know, what they were saying to us is that, well, no, people talk about a homelessness pathway, homelessness pathway, there isn't really a pathway, right? They feel like the moment they place someone in temporary accommodation, that's a dead end and that's where they're stuck. So why was that happening? And so as you ask these questions, the answers that we got back were really varied, unsurprisingly, on an individual case by case basis, you know, people had different ambitions, different goals, uh, different barriers and, uh, that were trapping them in place. But the underlying common denominator, which again, I'm sure is unsurprising to this audience, is that they were fundamentally financial in nature and that actually, you know, who knew? money is useful in our society, right? Like you can buy things with cash. Um, and so we were very motivated um, uh, to try to start something uh, in, the, in the UK to, tr uh, to bring personalized budgets to people. Um, and, and, you know, at the same time, we were, you know, as uh, uh, Mark has already mentioned, you know, very much inspired by evidence that was coming out of uh, um, lots and lots of different parts of the world um, from organizations like Give Directly, where they've basically proven that like cash transfers work really well at lifting people out of poverty, right? So, 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 so there's no reason to think it wouldn't work here um, and, and to try to adapt it to address uh, the problem of homelessness and inequality. Um, so that's what we did. So in 2018, we helped the first the first batch of people that we supported out of homelessness. At the time, we were sort of not even our own entity, actually. We were incubated by Aspire under their legal umbrella. And then what we did have done over the subsequent years is we supported over 850 people out of homelessness so far. We know that the impact is really, really uh, positive. I can share a lot more about the statistics and, and the outcomes that we're measuring uh, shortly. You can also find that on our website. Uh, but the immediate goal really is to try to help more people improve scalability and um and to try to inform public policy right so this is really interesting to me listening to 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 fran and mark um talk about this because it feels like thematically we're in very similar places you know we've sort of done a pilot we've tried it it works you know i think for people who know the evidence quite unsurprisingly it works so, so it's all about trying to take it to scale, right? And, and we were talking about this prior to um, opening up the room to the audience about sort of optimism and how we feel about things. I personally feel quite optimistic. I think that I think the, the conversation is shifting uh, uh, in our favor, right? But very quickly also then um, uh, to, to just get into a little bit more detail about how we work because we're not a UBI project. So that's quite uh, uh, an important uh, uh, point for me to, to flag here. We provide people with personalized budgets, right? And I'm very happy to, to answer any questions and have a debate about the various forms. So obviously I think we're all sort of along the same vein, aren't we, in terms of the ideas and the philosophy that we adopt. This is core idea that we should give people choice 
And believe it or not, believe it or not, they tend to make good choices uh, when it's their lives on the line. So how we work as a project uh, is that we do not duplicate any frontline support work. We currently work with over 60 partner charities, primarily in the southeast of England, but also running a couple of trials up north as well um, in Durham and Gateshead, um, where we essentially get them, our partner charities, to continue to do the frontline support work. So we're not trying to add to that chaos. You know, one of the most common complaints you hear from uh, people experiencing homelessness trying to access services is they feel passed around like a parcel from one service to another. Um, so we didn't want to add to that. So what we do is we trust them to do that work. They refer their clients to us when they're facing financial barriers on a pathway out. We then offer a little bit of financial planning support built around the individual uh, uh, person's ambitions. And then from there, quantify, identify the, the, the barriers along the way out and transfer the money to their support worker so that they can go jointly make the purchase together. The reason we transfer the money to the support worker is for me personally, quite a lot more practical um, we were very worried at the time. I mean, this kept me up quite a lot, actually, at the start of our project. I was very worried that if we transferred money into people's bank accounts, that would lead to benefit sanctions against them. And because on average, we're giving people about 850 to 1,000 pounds, the variance is quite large. We do go much larger than that. Um, but because the sums of money, really 850 pounds is not that much. You know, if you get your benefits sanctioned for even two months, you know, that probably wipe out all the benefits of the budget that we've given them. So just so quite purely practically, we transfer the money to the support worker and we let them go jointly make the purchase together. So as mentioned, we're a very evidence-driven crowd. Um, 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 uh, I, I think, again, quite unsurprisingly, you know, and we, uh, Alex and I kept were keeping ourselves quite honest at the start to say, look, if it doesn't work, we'll just wrap, wrap up and move on, right? Happily, I'm speaking to you today because... So far, the evidence shows that it does work. So 86% of the people we supported last year sustained and move on into stable housing, when nearly half made it into employment and on and on, uh, uh, the positive results go. Um, I think, Mark, you made such a good point at the end of your presentation there, really, because again, this is the same theme, isn't it? It comes back down to the point that, really, I don't think this is something that you know we should even question whether we can afford to do. It's more about whether we can afford to not do it, right? Because, because you know, we're spending eye-watering sums of money in the UK um, on managing the problem of homelessness. Temporary accommodation, as mentioned earlier, you know, we can talk about the cost estimates and the detail and if you want to and stuff, but looking at just temporary accommodation costs alone in the Southeast of England, we're spending on average, you know, or, or no, not on average, on the low end of average, 50 pounds per night per person on temporary accommodation. You multiply that out to 365 days, that's 18,000 pounds, right, per person per year. I mean, it's absolutely insane. And, and, and I often say like, you know, the only people who have really, you know, done well out of this crisis that we're seeing in the last sort of 14 years are people who own rundown backpackers hostels across the UK, right? Because if, if you own a, a rundown hotel in a seaside town, you're basically charging the council anything you want to, 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 to allow them to use your rooms as temporary accommodation. So um, I think I'll skip past the case studies. It's very, you know, you can find these very easily on our website as you move on. I think it's very important for us to try to break the stereotypes that we have as a society about homelessness. But, you know, I think the point is really in saying that the power of personalized budgets, UBI, cash transfers, that comes essentially in giving the individual the dignity of choice, right? And that actually very often when you allow them to exercise choice, you know, good choices are made. I'll just wrap up here to say uh, very quickly that, you know, in terms of uh, our plans for the future, look, we wanna keep scaling the project across the UK. We wanna keep showing people that this is a great way to help uh, people get out of homelessness. But also, I think very importantly, we're going to continue to try to improve the evidence. So Fran, you mentioned uh, the Center for Homelessness Impact earlier. So we're working with CHI on the Test and Learn program um, to run a large scale randomized control trial of personalized budgets in the UK. Very excited about that. You know, uh, we'll have to try to contain that excitement because the paper is not going to come out for 
uh, another two years or so, right? This is the nature of these things. Um, um, but yeah, you know, I think the future looks bright to me. You know, I think I think to be very clear, homelessness is a fight we're losing right now, right? Across the world, inequality in general is a fight that we're losing. But I think that um, uh, conversations like the ones we're having tonight are, are occurring more and more often uh, uh, across the UK as well as in the US. Um, and I think pure practicality will push us to action, you know, uh, and, and the evidence is there, you know, we'll keep building up the evidence base, right? But, you know, evidence doesn't speak for itself. You know, we need to do the hard work of doing the communication, of getting this across to more people in the public. And I think we're doing that. And I think we're, we're, we're quite successful with that, actually. And I, I use a collective we here, you know, so, so please do tell your friends about it. Uh, share this conversation. Um, and I, I think we're, we will get there. Um, and I'm hopeful in the near future. So I'll, I'll pause here and, and I'll let us move on to questions. Okay, thanks ever so much, Jonathan. Really interesting. And you can see from the pace at which we've been going tonight, there's so much more uh, to the 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 basic income project and to the greater change um projects and to fran's work uh the greater manchester mayor's charity so do, do uh, look at those links we're going to open the floor to questions now so if you'd like to put them in the chat um johnny is going to be fielding them we have some in already what i would say is um if people are here who are not from the ubi or basic income community Please don't think that anything's a daft question because we, you know, we really want to hear your questions and your ideas and your take on it because it's possibly something that we haven't thought of before. So we'd be really interested to hear from you. Um, one, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick off with a question, um, and it's to do with the change in attitude. I mean, I think Fran spoke about this before, the kind of white savior syndrome. Uh, sort of um, from within the homelessness sector itself. It's very interesting that uh, today, this is not to do with homelessness, but it's it's related. The the, evalu the first, ooh, first evaluation came out, you can't see that very well, for the Welsh um, pilot for care leavers. So if you, uh, perhaps Louis could put that in the, the, the link in as well. And it's interesting because there are the, it's, it's looking right back to the beginning of the... Uh, of the project where they interviewed professionals and professionals who who dealt with who who were sort of dealing with the care leavers and it said i'll read one out for you many expressed concern about the payments being un unconditional with a majority expressing the view that an expectation of engagement with employment educational training or simply support service should have been put in place there's concern about these these young people they're helping but I do wonder if there's also something about letting go if we're trusting people and if they're making their own decisions then the people who are in the position of you know I'm okay and I'm helping you they have to change just wonder if anybody would like to pick that up Uh, shall I say something quickly on that? Yes, please. Um, yeah. And I'd love to obviously hear everyone else's perspective as well. Um, but I, I think, yeah, absolutely. There, there absolutely is. I think very often if you're a, some kind of in, in some kind of job managing a grant, I think the temptation is to overmanage because I have to justify my existence in, in my job, right? Um, and I don't think this is like you know, I think people are well-meaning, right? It's this idea that, okay, the more oversight I have in theory, you know, I can try to squeeze more value out of the money that we have. But actually, I think what we're saying is that the evidence is showing that that's not necessarily true. Like you can have a lot more value in letting go of control. So instead of having hard criteria, uh, a list of, uh, you know, hard criteria on what you're allowed to buy with, you know, your budget, but actually if you let people choose instead of, you know, you choosing for them, that actually they tend to make good choices. So I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think absolutely, I think at almost like psychological, very micro, you know, frontline grant manager level, I think that is a, a, a key challenge. You know, I think the temptation is to, you know, the, the UK in theory, you know, local authorities have a discretionary housing payment uh, program, 
where in theory, you're supposed to be able to go to your council and get a bit of help with rent deposits and um, you know, uh, uh, things related to helping you secure housing. And it's supposed to be that kind of like, just get it done fund. But in practice, you know, that's never the case, right? Basically, you, you, you don't see uh, 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 that really working out that way. And I think it really is because when you are in that position of power, it's very, very, very difficult to say that actually I can add more value by offering light touch support than by offering, you know, a lot of management. So yeah, I think I think you're absolutely you, you hit on something there, Anson. Yeah. Thanks. Mark, Fran, would you like to say something on that? I, I think we're seeing in Denver that and, and I know this is elsewhere as well, that the peer-to-peer -peer model is really, really powerful. And so, you know, it's about transferring that power, tra transferring the cash, which is power, but transferring the responsibility to be an example and to coach and to uh, support people and community. And we're hearing from our participants as we hold events. We did a movie screening of Love Actually on December 27th. We're having an event at the Denver Botanic Gardens in a in a week and we invite the community. They're saying we want to come together as community. We want to support each other. And so that community piece, that social piece is really important. And so I think it's exactly what we're saying here is we need to step away and we need to seed power and we need to give the resources and let the community trust the community to, um, to chart their direction. What we think like the institution or approach that we've taken historically has not worked. So to think it's going to work going forward, I think is delusional. Thank you. Okay, we've got some questions. Um, I think we're asking people if they'd like to ask their own question and we can unmute them. And if not, I can ask the question. We have one from uh, Dr. Ian Gardner. Ian, would you like to ask your question? Can we unmute Ian? I'm not sure Ian might have dropped off the call. I know he's not. He's, I can see him at the top. Sorry. I, I think I've been unmuted. Ah. Hi, Ian. Yeah. Hi, bloody technology. Hi. Um, I, I think in response to the last question and the white saviour complex and the individual responsibility um, debate, let's say, um, there is some comparable evidence for local authorities and registered social landlords, housing associations, where housing benefit used to be paid automatically to the landlord. Um, and legislation changed a few years ago um, and has been paid more to the tenant in except exceptional circumstances. Um, and rent arrears went up, surprise, surprise. Um, so there is some comparable evidence about the exercise of individual personal responsibility. And I wonder whether the panel has any thoughts on that. Brad, did you? Uh, I'll say a little bit. I think it's important to emphasize that at, like our role in Greater Manchester is to support other frontline organizations in the work that they do. So I can speak reflecting back some of the conversations from even people on this call who were at the round table. But the key thing is uh, for us, and I think what came out of that round table is this relational approach and this recognition that it's not simply just a handout uh, or, you know, Ian, as you were saying, then is it kind of where the where the finances goes is kind of like symptomatic of this power relationship. So if you have if money is being given to someone as a personal grant, for example, and it is happening on the kind of platform or foundation of an, an, a pre-existing relationship, which is about supporting and working together to find solutions to kind of the, the experiences they're having, that's going to have more success than just perhaps, or I would imagine it'll have more success than just perhaps a random group of people who kind of first arrive at a programme with no prior input. So I just think that's slight tangent to what Ian was saying but I just think that's a really important element of it it's this relationship that is perhaps missing and actually perhaps even missing in this kind of um platform which we're all talking now you know talking from this kind of position of handing out the money or being able to hand out the money as opposed to that kind of co-discussion with people who um 
are using the money or might benefit from it. Okay. Um, we have another question from Casey Preen. Thanks, Ian, for your question. Is Casey on the call? Amanda, would she like to answer, ask her question? Hi, um, I've got two questions. I just wanted to uh, clarify, uh, first of all, if I've understood something correctly, because I was a little bit distracted earlier on, but um, I asked a question about um, participants who have mental health problems and um, issues with substance abuse. And I wasn't sure whether I was um, talking about the correct um, study. From from what I gather, it was um, the Denver one, they excluded people who had mental health and substance abuse issues. Is that correct? No, and uh, we use the basis twenty four self reporting tool to to um, the the goal was to exclude somebody that had uh, severe and specifically untreated mental health uh -huh. issues. And we and we do know that most people in this space have mental health or substance use or or the majority. So we actually excluded very few people with that tool. And um, there was some concern that was one of the areas going into this where, you know, there's some question about what the outcomes will be. But so far, the results have been really, uh, really encouraging. And uh, it was the same with Vancouver. They were more strict than we were. And so we felt that we could push a little further into that. And so we we really we have people, what we've heard is that people have said, I've been clean and sober since I got into this program because of the hope they're feeling and they don't want to lose this opportunity. So again, creating that foundation for change as opposed to trying to compel somebody to get there, we think is a fundamental shift. Okay. Um, so yeah, that has answered my question and the question that would have come from that. But I suppose I just wanted to ask as well, um, the question that Alison raised at the start about um, professionals um making assumptions about the people in these programs and that they need extra help um there from people that i speak to um, in my day-to-day -day life i know that there is a perception amongst the general public that you know it won't work you're just going to be like throwing money at people who are just going to waste it um and and i wonder sort of how do we sort of as a ubr community um deal with that perception and sort of um, overcome this idea that you know because because a lot of people I do feel I don't think that they consciously go around thinking that they're better than other people but they do make this assumption that they know better than someone who's in an unfortunate situation and the reason that I ask that is because um, it affects what our politicians will put forward in their manifestos if they think that the public want something terrible and draconian um, on homeless people then of course they're going to sort of say that and, and I just wonder sort of how do we move the political conversation forwards can I say something on that actually and I think that goes back to the point it's like how we think about people at risk of or experiencing homelessness it's everything we say when we talk about them and and they're these people who literally could be anyone on this call you know there was some research that came out last week or maybe the week before in the UK about the number of households that have less than a thousand pounds in their bank account. So if you've got less than a thousand pounds in your bank account in the UK, if you suddenly lose your job or face a kind of unexpected incident, the, the, the kind of buffer around you is really, really small. And we've seen the kind of extent of which the kind of welfare system and the economy is struggling. So when we talk about homeless people, or when we kind of think homelessness and look down and think sleeping bag, cardboard boxes, lifestyle choices, tents, we're not, we're, we're nowhere near being able to shift the political dial on it because we're still kind of defaulting to language and, and stereotypical images that doesn't actually truly reflect what the experience of homelessness is. So that's the starting point, kind of like really, really showing who experiences homelessness. And Sense of Homelessness Impact did a really great, um, destigmatizing um, image library that they released last year, which is like lots of different pictures of um, people who have experienced homelessness. And it's not your typical, you know, like older, when we're talking about older people in the news, there's always the frail hands and the kind of the walking sticks. It's that classic, let's internalize and stereotype the image. So I think that's that has to be the starting point for any of it. And we always need to push back on any dialogue or language that we accidentally or subconsciously use 
that creates this us and them, which we we all do. And it's 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 kind of a conscious thing you have to actively stop yourself from doing. Can I also quickly back Fran up there um, um, to, to say like the statistic, I don't think it's the same one, but it's a similar one, which was an ONS stat that said 42% of households in the UK have fewer than three months savings. That like really keeps me up at night. That's a lot of people. You know, 40, 42% is like, what, like the, almost 30 million people in the UK have almost no savings right now, right? That's really scary. I think the other thing um, um, as well is like, I think, yeah, totally correct that I think it's important to just bring nuance into the conversation because I get it, right? I, it, it's, 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 it's easy. It's, 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 it's a lazy shorthand, essentially. If you're writing a press article about it, if as a charity you're doing fundraising, it's very easy to communicate that you're a homelessness charity if you just plaster someone, you know, in a sleeping bag on the streets in in the top of your, um, you know, put a leaflet that you put through people's posts. But I think we need to do better. I think we just need to get, get away from that because I think that is where it starts. And I think it's it's also a part of the whole strivers and skivers narrative. You know, it's like people are homeless because they they've made done something so that they deserve it. You know, um, and, and I think in reality, the numbers show that that's, you know, not true at all. And I think I, 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 I'll add my little optimism thing here again to say, like, actually, it's I think the latest um, polling has shown that actually this, the kind of strivers and skivers narrative is increasingly loosening its grip. You know, like people don't really buy into that anymore, like increasingly so. So I think that, that I think I think we, we are succeeding to some extent, but you know obviously a lot more work to be done to fight that. I think that's you know stuff like that really needs to go before we'll be able to help you know public policy take the big step towards something like basic income or cash transfers. Yeah. Thanks very much. Jonathan. I'll uh, I'll just add a couple of things from a tactical standpoint um, on that. I think it's a really important question. I think the the evidence is already there, so. How do we shift mindset? How do we get the political and social will to move forward to policy? That's the big challenge. We know this works. So for instance, we've created a storytelling cohort. We start with a storyteller bill of rights that we share with our participants to make sure that they know that we only wanna do things that are uplifting for them, that are not extractive. We compensate our storytellers for the work we're doing. We prepare them for engagements with media. We bring them together like on the event next Thursday, we're having 10 of them participate with our top funders and our partners. And we're sitting at the table to talk about where are we gonna go from here? And so we put them in front of uh, the ones that are ready and, and and wanting to do this work and many do we we've had stories at the locally and nationally with uh um in the media um and we also i think proximity is important so when i think about scalability my goal is to be in 100 to 200 cities across the nation within uh, five years, serving 100,000 people with $1.2 billion annually of our unhoused neighbors. Proximity, so people are close to it. They know, maybe know somebody that's in the program so that these conversations are happening locally. You go to civic groups and you have these presentations, these conversations with 20, 30, 50 people. You go to your city council districts where we're planning meetings at each one um, throughout the year to have these discussions because most people don't really think about this or even understand this. And so it's really, it's education, proximity, and really doing a lot of uh, storytelling. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we've got uh, a question from Kath, who's unmuted, brilliant. Hi, Kath. Hi, uh, huge thanks to all of the speakers this evening. It's been incredibly uh, thought provoking. Uh, my question is about scale. So all of you have talked about scale and Mark, you've just touched then um, on what your sort of short to medium term goals are for scale. But I'm just thinking about what is the ultimate goal for scale? Because, um, I, you know, through the work that I do, like it's all about hyperlocal services. Um, but actually, like, it, you know, it, it keeping things in the local or in the regional, like there's potentially like an equity and, and inclusion issue there. So yeah, I'm just interested to hear what the ultimate goal is for you, you guys. Like Fran has the closest proximity to political powers. So maybe, maybe she goes further. 
Uh, I should massively caveat that by saying we are completely independent and he has no decision making power in our um, charity. Um, scale, though, you know, obviously, as a Greater Manchester Merge charity, we are kind of explicitly concerned with the city region of Greater Manchester. But if the issue that we're, we're working towards is to end homelessness and end the need for rough sleeping, given that that is outside of the kind of political powers of the city region in terms of what the drivers are, scale has to be kind of like all the way up to wherever central power is. You know, any kind of UCT programme, basic income, is going to counter some of the real drivers of kind of poverty and social immobility in, in the system and inequality, but we could take me on a very different tangent there. But all of these are kind of really, really heavily influenced by what happens in the central government, wherever you are. So if we want to see change in Greater Manchester, there's, there's a limit to how much we can do in Greater Manchester. There'll be a limit to how much you can do in any locality, even with all of the importance and the knowledge and the expertise and understanding that comes with that locality. At some point, you have to go up and be like, right, OK, where, how far upstream do we have to go? So that I think that's in terms of scale is really important. But then all the other challenges, if beyond kind of, the personal grant like how does it impact on people's lives which employers are going to be confused and you know thinking about benefits how do you get past that narrative for people that's another kind of scale issue but yeah thanks Jonathan I'll hand back to you <laughs> no I, I just echo everything you just said really I mean you know in our project we're seeing headwinds because of you know the broader macroeconomic context right like if we um, um, used to in 2018, 2019, can't believe I'm talking about that as if it were the good old days and they were nowhere near <laughs> like great times. Um, but, but you know, you, you could get someone, you know, maybe 1. 1. 1.5,000 pounds and that's a rent deposit and that's a great way for them to move into their own home. But actually, uh, you will find that nowadays 1.5,000 pounds doesn't cut it because the rental market has gone, you know, crazy. And 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 um the the truth is that, you know, with the LHA rates only very recently, the local housing allowance rates, so there's a housing benefit in the UK. Um, you know, because the rates were set three, four years ago and they were only recently unfrozen. At one point, they were estimated to be as low as being benchmarked to the fifth percentile of um of uh rental rates in the market. Right. So you can only afford 5% of potential houses. And, you know, needless to say, they're not going to be great, are they? Um, so, yeah, I think I think Fran's absolutely right. I think at some point you talk about the national scale, you know, sy systemically. So I think for us, we, we, we quite understand, like, the limitations of our theory of change, right? Like, I think to solve homelessness, if you have to pick the big three pillars and things you need to change there, housing supply, you know, better capacity for health and social care and financial resilience, right? And we act directly on that last pillar, but unfortunately I don't have a magic wand to conjure more housing in the UK at the moment. I wish I did, right? So um, so yeah, I think I think there's a whole host of systems changes that need to be implemented and they can only be done at scale, uh, at, at a national scale. But I think then the also on, on the counterfactual on a more sort of, so, um, not counterfactual, just on the, on the other point though, on a very sort of, practical point. Um, I, I don't think in the UK, homelessness and housing is going to be an issue that will be reabsorbed by central government anytime soon, right? Because partially because they know what a nightmare it will be for, for them to take care of. So I think it will continue to be quite a devolved issue, um, is my, you know, reading and understanding of the situation. So in that sense, I think there is um, a, a lot of work to be done still to affect local practice while simultaneously trying to trying to change minds and, and tweak national policy, right? You still have to affect how local practice is done. You know, even after policy change is made, you still have to be there to make sure that, you know, ideas are being implemented to a high fidelity of ideas. You know, so yeah, I think there, there's a lot of important work to be done at local and national level, you know, just because practically that's that's how it's going to be structured, you know, in, in the next 10 years. Thank you. Um, I think we have a question from Harry, but I think he's gone, unless he's come back again. No, I'm going to ask his question because it was a follow-up to, to Kath's. He said, you're all doing phenomenal work on direct action and making change on the ground, which is critical for actually making a difference. 
Guess I'm wondering, similar to CAF, how does this turn regional national? And then another question, do you do much policy advocacy campaigning work as part of your day to day? So I don't know if you'd like to. We're starting to do more. Starting Indeed. to do more, right. So what sort it of thing? It's inevitable. Got... Yeah, it's the short answer. Uh, Mark, I don't know what, 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 the, the American perspective. We're, we're trying to educate. Uh, so like with our town hall meetings, we're trying to show what's possible. And so I think our, our approach to getting to scale is to demonstrate the outsized outcomes that we can achieve and, and just have that example drive uh, adoption. So um, that's the way we're working on it. We want to just keep supporting the, 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 uh, the community and creating those accelerated pathways to housing. I know I did see, there was a, a question about it, my missing charts. And so the, the, they are in there, I posted them there. But for instance, at six months, um, you know, 34% of the people that were getting $1,000 a month uh, were reporting to be in a house or apartment that they rent or own. 40% of group B, the one that got to 6,500, the lump sum. Um, and that's continued, that trend is continued trending up. Interestingly, the group that got the 500 a month looks like it might be leveling a little bit. And as we go into the extension, we changed. So it was everybody's getting $1,000 a month and we increased our comparison group to 100. But also really interesting to note that in the comparison group, people only getting $50 a month at, um, at six months, 31% were in housing. And so like this, this assumption about how much is needed to move the needle as opposed to maybe a change in how we approach people and how we honor them and make them feel like a part of the community might and, and engage with them. So maybe some of those people are housed because they re-engaged with our partners. So if finding pathways that work, I think, is the path to scale something that's actually working and pr providing relief and opportunity and safety and paths to thriving will, I hope, be replicated. Thank you. Um, can I just put in a bit of a bit of a wave the flag for UBL Lab Manchester here? Because um, that's one of the things that we're trying to do is campaign. And in fact, on the 11th of March, Mark is going to be giving a presentation to uh, Mayor Andy Burnham, the, uh, the mayor of Greater Manchester, on the work that's been done on the Denver Basic Income pro, uh, Project. And so we're trying to link up all the good work that is being done on the ground to, to policymakers, specifically Andy Burnham for us, really, because he's if you watch the his talk at the Basic Income North Conference, I, I watched it again today, and he's very positive. He's very, very positive about um, uh, uh, two things, two, his two pillars are providing a home for people and providing a decent income possibly through a basic income not just for not just for homelessness but for just you know general dignity and living across the north sort of thing um so th this this is is a really interesting discussion for us to be able to to take to him um but the thing he will always say i mean i we had um an evening, me Compass, an organisation in this uh, country, did a, a, an evening at uh, Manchester. It was all music and dance and et cetera. And we could ask him, Andy Burnham, questions. He came along to talk to us. And my question was pulled out of a hat with great cheer as, uh, as, it, as it read out, are we going to have a basic income pilot in Man Greater Manchester? And he said, yeah, great. If, uh, if we pass the bucket round, you know, how's it going to be funded? And that's always what we come to. And it is amazing to hear you talk, Mark, and these huge scales in terms of, you know, money for, for funding for, for pilots or demonstrator projects. And obviously, Jonathan, you've been very, very um, successful in raising funds. And Fran's charity raises a lot of money to for directly for, for homeless people. Um, but it is something that is if not a mental block for us, then certainly a huge challenge. And I just wondered if you had any words of encouragement there. So we don't have to persuade Andy Burnham, it's a, it's a good idea, but we have, to, we have to persuade him how it's gonna be paid for. I mean, from our perspective, obviously, 
we and we said at the at the round table where there's appetite and evidence which there is and where we can do it in partnership with the organizations across greater manchester that are working with people at risk or currently experiencing homelessness we would we would want to facilitate it and support it but it's kind of working out how do you how do you resource that? How do you resource that alongside the other elements that we work in? So anything from um, the the Bed Every Night scheme to supporting kind of more um, targeted prevention work, such as universal basic income type things would fit, fit under to resource in the temporary accommodation sector. It's that balancing act. And again, you can go back to those stats and numbers and kind of like the, the great stats Jonathan was sharing about the kind of return, if you look on his website, the kind of like, what is like 20 times return for the government based on the couple of pounds or a thousand pounds that they would share. Um, it's a really easy argument to make, but until someone actually hands you the cash, um, which the government aren't going to do. So it's kind of, how do we do that? So for, for Mayor Burnham to be supportive of it, course he's supportive because this would have a real positive impact on the city region um, and be a really good case study for what we should be doing nationally but if the devolution deal he has doesn't allow him to use the resources he has to do that we have to get it from the business community for example or trust and foundations and um, so it's it's the looking up I think like a lot to be learned from Mark and Jonathan on how they resource their work but yeah Yes, I wasn't. I wasn't suggesting your charity paid for it, Fran. Don't worry. <laughs> no, yeah, it is. It's 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 a big challenge. So, Mark or Jonathan, what what could you? I was just going to say of of the twelve plus million that we've raised so far, four million of that is is public, and so yeah, we are leading with private. And I think when you're doing demonstration work, it's easier to move quickly. We actually turned down the city's offer for money in the in the first year because we thought they were going to slow us down. We wanted to launch quickly and show what's possible. So I'd say try to get something actually in, in motion as quickly as possible. If you can get a lead funder or a, a group of funders that puts some capital down and then go to the foundations and then go back to the city, that's kind of the way we approached it. And now there's, you know, despite having a huge influx of, of migrants and, and, and $185 million potential cost that was unexpected to the budget, they're saying that the work that we're doing is showing such efficiency that they want to expand with us. So I think it's demonstrating and then building those partnerships, building the trust across the continuum of care, creating hope, not just with participants, but with everybody in the space that's working so hard, but so frustrated by the results. If you can start having really positive outcomes and collaboration, that's when you can really get momentum. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure know. how much encouragement I can give on that, but I, I think I would just say that, you know, I think the support is out there and we just need to keep banging on the drum and sticking to the theory of change and finding the supporters. I think that's probably quite, you, you know, as, as Mark's suggesting, essentially, you're looking for your early adopters really at this stage. It's not so much, it's still not so much trying to speak broadly but I think the, obviously the other interesting thing is that, you know, as Fran, as you're pointing out, it's it, again, it's just almost one of those things that we can, almost can't afford not to do. But, and, and I think the money is in, does exist in this country to do it, but it's just very siloed up. So it's very difficult, you know, local authorities, if you tell them that you can save them that money on temporary accommodation, that's a cost that they can very quickly recognize savings to, in theory. But of course, what's happened is that their budgets have been squeezed so much that really they have no headroom beyond providing the bare statutory uh, 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 support, right? So, so I think a part of this is about, you know, when we talk about devolution of power politically and things like that, that also has to come with budgetary devolution. Like you need to give local authorities more money or there is no way we'll be able to, you know, find any headroom to invest in something that will, you know, so well evidenced, right? Like this evening is, is, is sort of demonstrating, you know, that it's, it's, it's a very well evidenced piece of work um, and we should be able to, to, to find the ability to scale this and show it. I think the other very interesting, you know, uh, cousin to our, to, in our world is, is housing first as a project in the UK, right? I mean, very, very good, high quality randomized control trials in the US proving that housing first works. Finland as an entire country has proven that housing first works. And of course we've run lots and lots of pilots in the UK, but 
why can't we scale it up? And and it comes back down to, you know, are people prepared to put the money behind it? And, and I think what we have to be able to say is just, we need to continue to have this conversation um, with people in power um, and to try to push it. I mean, I think housing first as, as a- as a Jonathan, sort of could I just interrupt you? Could you just explain really quickly what housing first is? Oh, sorry. Yes, I'm so sorry. Yeah, oh, housing okay. first as a policy is basically, um, um, you know, at its very core, it's about treating housing as a human right, right? So it basically says, look, we're gonna give you unconditional housing doesn't really matter what you do or don't do. You know, we will not evict you, right? We're just going to keep you in suitable, safe housing, warm, you know, uh, uh, indefinitely um, uh, without conditions. And, and, and yes, you try to wrap support services around that uh, when it's appropriate to do so. Um, and I saw Rachel from GM, uh, uh, the Greater Manchester Bridges Outcome Partnership, there, and she she will tell us a lot more about housing first, I think. A <laughs> uh, 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 um, much more appropriate person to answer about that. But I think it offers a really, really important parable for us, uh, the housing first cousin, because they've done successful pilots, very successful pilots in the UK, and yet they are struggling still to get this policy mainstream, right? So there are, there are steps, aren't there? There are levels. I think at first you face the skepticism. I think we are about to overcome that in, uh, 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 in the UK. I'm, I'm positive uh, on that front. They were about to produce really great evidence in the next two years for it. But I think then the next step beyond that will be, you know, are we prepared? Is the Treasury prepared to cut the check? And I think that's a whole other, you know, um, policy communications can of worms, right? Um, um, so there's a lot of work ahead, um, but I think we are making progress. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, we've got five minutes, so do, would any of, I think that sounded like a, a good wrapping up speech from Jonathan, unless he wants to say any more. Is there anything that Mark or- I, I did want to add one thing to that because Denver actually did a really interesting experiment with, with Housing First and a social impact bond. Um, and, and so we're looking at, as a funding stream, we're looking really closely at this pay for success models. So you get private funding that gets put in, you have benchmarks that you need to meet, but when you meet them, then the city or the federal government puts the money back in. So it's less risk for the government. It's easier. They're really interested in doing that. And you can ratchet those up over time. And so, you know, in our, we saw a shelter for our group A dropped from 20 usage from 22% to 11% at six months. And from in group B, 26% to 10%. Um, and even in group C from 21% to 9%. And so you can quantify those cost savings. You can quantify the reduction in healthcare interactions or health services interactions. You can quantify the, um, the reduction in, uh, in interactions with the criminal justice system. And so I think if you're struggling with finding the, putting the equity stack together, or the funding stack, that that's a, a, another way to look at it. And I would look at that social impact bond study from Denver. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, do we, do we have Niall still? Sorry, I missed your question. It's really practical question. And it is, how does a street homeless person receive payment if they do not have a bank account or ID? We, we give a, a reloadable debit card. Um, and it's interesting that um, that uh, while 50% of our participants were banked, only 25% decided to use the banking system. Uh, most chose to use the rechargeable debit card. Uh, and, and that creates a logistical challenge because that and the phones are constantly being stolen and lost. And so um, that's part of the, one of the challenges of, 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 uh, of running the program. I was really meaning about the UK. Sorry? I was meaning about the UK, like where well, you, you get benefits, you get paid to your uh, burner phone, you get a pest payment paid to your burner phone. But I'm just wondering if you guys know about the HSBC and FA model. No. So, Fran, I think you you guys ran the cash transfers trial with CHI, right? We don't transfer money to people, as mentioned. We we this is a, again one of the practical reasons why we didn't do it. But I think, Fran, you 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 did, didn't you, with your uh, cash transfers trial? No. So in Manchester, we were one of the ones that were selected as the initiative. Um, however, due to some of the eligibility criteria, it wasn't actually possible to get that over the line. Um, but yeah, Niall, as you say, there are challenges. There are some banks, I think that's what you're referring to, the HSBC one, aren't you? So yeah. it's possible. But now you, you tell them because it's a really useful scheme to know on. Yeah, the HSBC model, 
it's the only bank in the UK where the client doesn't need ID or uh, an address that all goes off my work ID. I'll make an appointment at the bank. Within four weeks, the guy sat in front of someone at the HSBC bank, 30 minutes interview, happy with all the checks. That guy walks out of a life bank account there and then. No issues, no jumping through hoops. Simple. No other bank in the UK does it. No wish they did. That's my quote over. Sorry. Thank yeah, you. No, no. I think I think that's right. I mean, in all the cash transfers trial in the UK I know of, it's it's not super difficult to open someone a, a bank account for someone. Sometimes they just use like yeah. the charity's address and things like that. So it is possible, yeah. Well, other banks like Lloyd's in um, co-op are asking for letters of introduction. Not West, you just phone the exceptions line, you've got benefits letter, HMRC letter, that's proof ID, but HSBC is super quick, super efficient, and dead easy and painless. Okay, right, thanks very much, Niall. Uh, we've got one minute to go. Uh, we have a question from Daniel. Uh, I'm not sure we've got actually time for an answer, but I think it's a, it's a good one to, it's a good thought to end on. How do the panelists think we can break out of our bubble and convince more people that unconditional cash is a force for good. And I don't know if anybody's got a one sentence, you know, response for that, but that's something that we're always looking at within the UBI Lab Network is to break out of our bubble. We, we can talk to each other endlessly about how marvelous all these ideas are, but we need to get it out there. So I, and I think you guys are doing it. And I, I think it's something we need to be, um, we need to be thinking about constantly. Uh, thank you so much. I've been really, really encouraged by this evening. Um, I think everybody goes through ups and downs, don't they, on their journey with these things. And times like this are, are just wonderful to hear such enthusiastic, dedicated people talking about their work. So thank you very much to Fran and to Mark and to Jonathan and good luck with all your projects for the future. And we'll wait to hear more about them. And um, We'll be in touch. We'll be in touch and, and keep these conversations going. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, everyone. Good night. Night, Thank everyone. You, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.